an example of something that we did for this. We did a project called Paper Laugh last year, which did very well at Cannes. That's my plug. Um, but I'll play this and then talk over it. It's the guy, the technologist down in Barcelona, every year they get invited to Sonar and they do a, a digital experience or they do some uh, sort of play. Um, they do some uh, like music or interactive pieces. It's usually just a bit of fun. Um, and this year they did the same thing, or rather last year they did the same thing. They, did, uh, they wanted to create a club where the users created the music track. Uh, so they, they got a bunch of iPads, they put some facial recognition software on it, and then the data that came out of the facial recognition software drove an Ableton Live. So the Ableton would then build a track taking data according to what your eyebrows or your mouth or your nose were doing or whether you were blinking or your eyes were open. And it was just a bit of fun. Um, it went down well at Sonar. But at exactly the same time, about the week that this went live, the guys at Serranos McGann over in Barcelona came to our colleagues in, in, in Barcelona and said they'd come up with an idea to change the, 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 the business model, the way that people pay for entertainment. They wanted to work out how much people were enjoying the entertainment and then bill them accordingly. So bill them uh, percentage, uh, uh, proportionately to how much they're enjoying themselves. So we had been researching facial recognition for a little bit and we said, what if you did the same thing you put in, a, in the theater, you put cameras in there that could read and we wrote some software that was smart enough to tell if that person was having a good time. Um, and then every time that person does have a good time, they get billed. Uh, it sounds evil, but it was, uh, it was good. Um, but the, the, the key thing is you, you, you make the computer smart enough. We didn't just say, this is what a smile looks like. We loaded in 25,000 images of people smiling uh, and averaged it out and said to the computer, if, you, if the face in front of you looks a little bit like this or looks or rather a lot like this, I think it had to be 80 to 85% like a smile that it recognized, then it would then monetize that smile. It would take a photo of that and then send it to the payment desk at the front. So when you walked out, you were presented with a ticket, and the ticket was all of, your pic all of the pictures of you smiling throughout the event. I'll play the video. It's just two minutes long. It explains it better than me. The industry of the art in Spain has suffered one of the most grandes of all time. The government decided to change the tax on theatrical spectacles from 8 to 21% logrando la mayor sangría de espectadores que se recuerde. Un 30% menos de espectadores en tan solo un año. La gente se volcó a consumir entretenimiento probado masivamente como los propuestes americanos. Ante esa realidad, la compañía independiente de comedia teatraneo decidió tomárselo con humor e inventar algo. Pay per laugh, the first comedy shows where you only pay for what you consume. We fitted each seat with a facial recognition system that detects the smile and proposed the following deal to spectators. Entrance will be totally free. If the show produces no laughs, you don't pay anything. However, if you laugh, you have to pay for each smile. Each smile produced is worth 30 euro cents, something that in this day and age is quite a reasonable price. At the end of the show, the spectator could check their laughter account before paying and even share it on social networks. And so that no one would cry for having laughed more than they could afford, the maximum amount to pay was 80 laughs for 24 euros. The average price of the ticket increased by 6 euros. The system was covered by the main national media outlets, and this produced 35% more spectators. Each paper laugh show produced 28,000 euros more ticket money than was normally taken. Currently, the system is being copied in other theatres in Spain. A mobile phone app was created as a system of payment, and the first season ticket was launched for the number of laughs, not shows. We should also not write off the paper cry. Or paper what the fuck system. What the fuck? What the fuck? Or maybe not. Paper laugh. The first comedy shows where you only pay for what you consume. Thank you. Uh, I should also say with that, the, the, the idea is brilliant, but the, the film and all the production was handled by Canada, obviously the really talented directors over in, uh, over in Spain. Um, yeah, without that, the whole thing is kind of nothing. Um, the next thing is urgency is the child that helps his little sister get dressed. Uh, so this is the nice, cuddly side of urgency that tries to help you all the time. Um, 
I, I guess put simply, the, we have to accept that urgency is required for everything. Without a job or without children crying, none of us would get up in the morning. Um, there's, it, it drives, it's, it's, it's not part of work, it's part of everything. There's a deadline to everything. While I was researching this, I found this quote, which I thought was brilliant. Knowing that you're going to die creates a certain focus on your activities in life. Uh, everyone has a deadline. Um, this guy is an economist, not a gloomy person. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it's effectively, it's a, it's a vital tool in everything that we do. Uh, it separates uh, what we did at university in a very free sort of expressive environment through to what we do in the commercial world. I think the reality now, without sounding too negative, is not can you do it, it's can you do it by 9 a.m. Monday morning, uh, meaning everything that that entails, working the weekend, thinking quickly, having the skills on tap. Um, there's another, there's a th it's another theory, it's a, it's a principle called Occam's Razor. I, I lose people when I explain this. Uh, Occam was a, uh, he was a sort of theorist and a scholar in 13th century England. Uh, and he came up with the idea that when you're positing different theories, when you're suggesting different solutions to a particular problem, uh, you should always go for the one that has the, f the fewest unknown elements. Uh, and translating that to our, um, our industry, sometimes the first idea is the best. The thing that when somebody pitches an idea at you, they give a brief, and then you think, how would I solve that? Very often, the first thing that pops into your mind is right, uh, and you can overcomplicate things. There is always a danger of overcomplicating, over-theorizing, over-testing a little bit later on. One of the things that the guys in the animation department at our company do from time to time is when they've got a, a rare gap between projects, but when they do, they like to try and flex their muscles a little bit and, uh, and sort of uh, reinvigorate the... After working in a commercial environment, they just want to do something that's expressive, a little bit free, but they always put very strict deadlines on them, sometimes more than the commercial deadlines. They give themselves... Tw in the case of the next films that I'll put up, they get, uh, one guy, Dan, he gave himself... 20 days to make a complete 30 second animation, uh, designing characters, writing it, obviously there's nobody else involved in this. The brief actually came from, it's a much, much smaller event than this, but it's in Amsterdam, it's where, it's called cross-pollination, and they bring different people from different industries together, try and mix some ideas and come up with new businesses, new schemes. Um, so with the loosest of briefs, he just wanted to come up with something in 20 days entirely on his own. Um, it's interspecies sex, so I don't know where his head was at the time. <laughs> and I've got two of these as well, so if you're not turned on by bear or salmon, then I've got caterpillars for you. But I'll just play it. And while we're in that area, I'll play the next one. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the classic example of a first idea, but um, it's... Thank you. Um, but it is nice that if, if, you're, if you're losing that sense of urgency with your commercial work, it's nice that the guys have an outlet where they can train themselves. They can step out of commercial world for a while, uh, sharpen up on some... And this guy, he actually wanted to... He didn't want to do anything about animation. He wanted to get the lighting right and get the materials so that it looked like cardboard, felt like it was stage lit. So uh, he had something very specific he wanted to get out of it. But he achieved in 20 days on his own something that if we went through a regular commercial format, lots of questions being asked, lots of changes to the brief, new creative ideas coming in, uh, and other directors' opinion, that probably would have been a team of maybe five or six people and maybe double the time. Um, and moving on to the last argument... Um, urgency is other people's children, fun in small doses. Uh, this, is, this is the negative bit, so my PR person, she's not here, that doesn't matter. Um, the key about the thing that I mentioned before with the animators is that it happens occasionally, it's not constant. Uh, occasionally you go into periods where every single project has a really punishing deadline, every single project has uh, urgency written on it, every 
uh, brief that lands on your desk has this has money this has money problems attached to it, and it it does get tiring after a while. It's it, it, obviously it's not always and forever, but you do go through periods of time like that, uh, and it can get. The idea of urgency loses its potential then. It's not the occasional thing where everybody feels invigorated and they feel a challenge and everybody pulls together. They just remember the last 40 weeks straight that they worked until 10 at night, didn't see their families and children, and, and they, they start to sort of, uh, the creativity starts to seep out of the process after that. Um, the other thing, yeah, we're, as I said, we're craft practitioners, good way of putting it. Um, we've... I've judged events recently. I was at Eurobest in Helsinki last year, and I thought an interesting thing was uh, we were, I was in the craft jury, and when we, were, when we were getting to the really tiny decisions, like which one wins gold, which one wins the Grand Prix, it came down to very small differences between two really excellent films. And the production companies were all saying, oh, if only we knew what budget they had. And all the post people were saying, if only we knew how much time they had. And it's a complete different way of thinking. A lot of the people in... in in my end of the industry, I want to make business for the company, but people want to um, uh, know that they've got enough time to really get the best out of the film. The production guys obviously want to make sure that they get the right location their director wants, they've got enough money for the casting, wardrobe, everything like that. But it is really a split. We, I, I realize at my end of the industry, we're more concerned about time than we are with money, which is why we're all poor. Uh, that's <laughs> absolutely clear to me, I'm sure. Um, and then lastly, this is a summary. Urgency is not the bully, he's the product of bad parenting. So, yeah, in summary, with my tiny eyes reading my tiny writing, urgency isn't going anywhere, it's here to stay. Uh, it always has been, it's a fundamental part, it's a necessary element of daily life in the working environment. We'll never do without it, it will always be there. Uh, the second thing is managing expectations. This is anybody in the process, making sure that one person higher up the chain than you is well aware of what they're asking and what reality dictates, whether it's money, time, skill, whatever. Uh, genuine craft, creative exploration, development of ideas and techniques just takes time. Uh, exploration provides unexpected creative solutions. Third one, if urgency is a driving factor on a brief, make sure that you get skills, expertise, and experience on board quickly. They're fundamental for achieving your goals. And as I forgot earlier on, you have to trust those people as well. There's no point bringing in all the best people and then micromanaging the shit out of it. It won't work. They know what they're doing. You've paid them for a reason, and then it's a case of letting them run with it. They care almost more about your project than you do. You have to believe that. Um, urgency can be the catalyst to great work. Uh, it's a useful tool for focusing the mind, like the death life thing, um, and it can provide the most elegant solution. Elegance is a carefully chosen word, it, not extravagant, but elegant. Smooth, streamlined, clear, defined. And the fifth one, a constant state of emergency is tiring, and it doesn't get the best out of creative minds. Uh, used occasionally, and in the right circumstance, it can be very powerful indeed. Thank you for listening.